If you would, would you stand with me if you're capable for the reading of God's Word? I want to begin today in Luke chapter number 1, and I want to read four verses beginning with verse number 26. Luke chapter number 1, beginning with verse number 26. I'm going to read down for now through verse number 29. Now, if you're new to the Bible and all, this book is almost like kind of right in the middle, almost kind of in the middle to the right. It's, a, it's the gospel account, the story of the ministry, the life of Jesus, and what was going on at that time, written by the author, the human author, is Luke, in, who was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Luke is writing this some years after Christ, looking back on, on time, because Luke didn't actually walk with Jesus uh, physically during the, the majority of his ministry. So Luke comes along a little bit later, but he's looking backwards, and he's giving to us the oral tradition and the stories, and he's encapsulating this together for us. Luke is also the author of um, the book of Acts. And so in the beginning, they were read together almost like a, a, a two-fold book. It was called Luke-Acts. Later in time, this is just a little history for you, they were separated as independent books, which is fine to do. But if you ever are in, in encouraged by the book of Acts, connect it with the book of Luke and, the Luke and Luke with the book of Acts. So just a little history for you. So here we pick up in verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, who was a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to Mary and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. I wonder how you would process an angelic visitation with a heavenly announcement. Oh, I know, you want us to think you would just put your shoulders back and stand real tall and say, yes, Gabriel, speak for the Lord's servant is listening. I am confident in this one thing that you are here from God and I am hearing from God. No, confused and disturbed, Mary tried to figure out what in the world just happened. What? in the world just happened. Pray with me. Father, thank you so much for your word as we look into it now. I pray that you would give us hearts and ears and minds to receive, Lord, to block out all the distractions, all the Christmas parties that we're going to, all the calories that we're going to consume, all the weight that we're going to gain during the holidays. I just rebuke it all in Jesus' name. <laughs> give us minds that are alert and sharp because you have surely gathered us together today to give us a word in this season. And so we receive from you today by your spirit in Jesus' name. Help me to communicate what you've placed in my heart. In Christ's name, amen and amen and amen. You could be seated in the Lord's presence. This is part number 11 in our message series entitled, Maybe It's Time. If you're new, I'll just give you a little history. I started posting on social media several months ago. Some thoughts that all begin with maybe it's time you realize or maybe it's time you consider. And over a period of time, I, I just I, people began to respond to those, and it was interesting the way they were sharing and commenting. And all of a sudden, I began to realize, I said, you know what, I, I think I can support a few of these with Scripture. So maybe this would become a, kind of the, 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 the foundation for a message series. I really didn't think I would be into part number 11. Next week, Lord willing, I'll conclude the message series with part number 12. But they're just thoughts that have come to me as we consider this concept of maybe it's time. And so today I want to share with you part number 11. If you've missed any of the messages, I always encourage you to visit our website, Life Church Smyrna, and on the top bar on the resource tab. You can avail yourself to all the resources, the visual presentations, the notes that are in your worship guide, your bulletin today are there. The blanks will already be filled in online for you. You can listen to the audio. You can watch the video. You can subscribe to our podcast. All of these resources are there for your spiritual edification, but share them with other people. That's what's so important. Not just something that helps you, but share it. Forward the link to the message or the notes to somebody else. Use them in your personal or your family devotion. So I just wanted to, to be be able to set the background for this. I won't go through as a reminder all of the previous uh, focus of the, of the messages, but they're all there for you, for your encouragement, for your edification. So let me give you some holiday tips, if you will, some Christmas party eating tips. I want to be your friend and I want to help you this Christmas season. So number one, avoid eating carrots. 
If you see carrots, leave immediately and go next door. This is if you're going to a party, right? Number two, drink as much eggnog as you can. It doesn't matter that there are 10,000 calories in every sip. Just drink as much as you can, all right? Number three, if something comes with gravy, use lots of it. Gravy is not intended to be a standalone item, so make sure you pour it on thick. This may help you when we get downstairs for our meal today. Number four, ask if the mashed potatoes were made with skim milk or whole milk. And if they say skim milk, leave immediately and go to another party. All right? Number five, do not have a snack before going to a party. The idea of going to a party is to eat as much free food as you possibly can, so don't mess up the plans. All right? Number six, do not exercise between now and New Year's. This is the time for long naps, which you're going to need after carrying that big heavy plate around the buffet table five or six times. Number seven, if you see something really good, position yourself nearby and don't budge. Get as much of it as you possibly can before everybody detects you and begins to talk about you. Number eight, if pies are served, have a slice of each. You can always exercise in January, right? Number nine, if someone offers you fruitcake, avoid it at all costs. I mean, you have to have some manners and scruples, right? And then lastly, number 10, if you don't feel stuff when you get up from the table, reread these tips and start all over, but hurry because Christmas will soon be over. So those are just some of my Christmas party tips that I want to share with you, and I trust they'll be a blessing to you as your territory is enlarged and as you loosen your belt. All right, number 11, part number 11, maybe it's time to realize that Christmas is an announcement Christmas is an announcement. Now, last week I shared with you that Christmas was no accident, and we looked historically at some of the things that had happened. I shared with you that there were over 300 Old Testament prophecies about the coming of the Messiah that Jesus fulfilled all of those just as one human being, one person. That was concerning his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. There were many that pointed just singularly to his birth, I think about 47, if I remember correctly, that Jesus fulfilled mathematically the number, the, 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 the possibility, that is to say mathematically, of one person fulfilling over 300 prophecies by themselves is a number that's so large that mathematicians don't even have a way to communicate that. It's like one to the tenth Power, what one to the tenth it was like a billion or something like that power over it's just unreal that one person but y'all Jesus did all of that for hundreds and hundreds and even thousands of years there was a looking forward a foretelling if you will a, a prophesying that Jesus would come and in doing so God was as I shared with you last night, last week, excuse me, it seems like last night, last week, just wanting us to realize it was no accident. It it didn't just happen. It wasn't just some lady who got pregnant and suddenly had this baby and it just kind of all fell together. No, it was in the plan in the heart of God. And similarly today, I want to share with you a few thoughts that reinforce this concept that Christmas is really an announcement. So let me, let me jump right in. First of all, I want to share with you that Christmas is an announcement <clears throat> that God's grace is available to everyone. God's grace is available to everyone. Now, I want to just kind of set this up a little bit to help us understand that prior to the birth of Jesus Christ, there were a group of people known as the Israelites, the Hebrews, the children of Israel, and they were and still are considered to be um, God's precious people, God's, God's people, the people of God would be how they would be referred to, the promised people of God. And so much of what you read in the Old Testament as you go through and see about the promises of God and the provision of God, it was intrinsically connected to those who were either Israelites by birth or who had become Israelites by choice. That is to say, they may have not been born in the land of Israel, but they ascribed to the tenets of of Judaism, and they lived their lives as Jews. And so there were some who were born Jews and some who became Jews by choice. But the Old Testament primarily is focused on that group of people, the children of Israel, the Hebrews, the Jewish people, all words that are used interchangeably. But Christmas, that is the birth of Christ, began to be something that was set in motion or that did set in motion a new aspect of what God had been doing and what God really had wanted to do all along. 
And so I want us to recognize that when Jesus is coming into the world, first and foremost, God is declaring to the world that his grace is now available to everyone. It didn't matter whether you were a, a, an Israelite by birth or you became an Israelite by choice. But rather, something was happening that was going to go beyond the people of God, that is, the, the Israelites, the children of Israel. And so when, when the angel Gabriel in Luke chapter 1, verse 28, comes to Mary and he says, Greetings, uh, favored woman, that word favor literally means grace. It, it could be translated just as easily grace, woman of grace, or, or woman who has received grace. And Gabriel was saying, listen, everything that I'm about to tell you after this, these few words is all based upon the fact that you have received God's grace upon your life. Now, we don't know a lot about Mary. Uh, other than what we read in the text, some historical writings would, would give us a few other insights. But the truth is, is that Mary was a very devoutly religious young lady, a Jewish lady, she who had lived her life committed to following the ways of God that the people of God had subscribed to, or ascribed to, I should say. And so when the angel comes to Mary and declares that she's favored, what he's actually saying is, Mary, God's grace is coming upon you, and God's grace is going to come upon you in a whole new way. See, what I want us to recognize is that Christmas is an announcement of God's grace. Because before, listen, i got to tell you this, before you receive Christ as your Savior, before you even begin to believe on Him, you may not have realized it, but the grace of God had been on your life long before the day that you said yes to Jesus. In fact, let me show you what I mean. Sometimes before we come into a relationship with God, we'll say things that, uh, in one way that later we would say differently. So, for example, before we start a relationship with God or receive Christ into our life, we might say something like this. You know what? I started to take that job, but something told me I ought not take that job. Or, I, you know what? I was dating that person, but something just told me I ought to, I ought to break that off. Or, hey, I was going to buy that house, but I don't know. Something just kind of let me know I shouldn't do it. Well, what you need to realize now, looking back over your life, is that those are moments when the grace of God kept you from being really, really stupid and making some really horrible mistakes. So after Jesus, you might say, you know what? I was going to buy that house, but the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said this. Or I was, gonna, I, I was dating that person, but you know, I just felt impressed of the Lord to just end the relationship. I felt like God had somebody back better for me. I didn't need to go down that path or I was going to take that job or buy that house, but God let me know this. What I want you to realize is that even when we didn't notice it, even when we wouldn't acknowledge it, even when we wouldn't even admit it, God's grace has been on our life for all of our life. He's been working and guiding and providing and protecting. We just didn't recognize it. But Christmas now is an announcement of God's grace, and it begins by Gabriel saying, Mary, you're favored. You've got God's grace. He's hand-selected you. He's chosen you. He wants us to recognize that, that Christmas is God's way of announcing that he wants everybody to experience this grace, not only that Mary had experienced, but that you and I have experienced. Let me show you what I mean. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, we're told that it's by grace that we've been saved through faith. It's God's grace that we receive by faith. The grace that God extends to us is received through the faith that we have, and that's what saves us. It's not of ourselves. We can't brag about it. We can't say, well, I earned it, or I deserve it, or I did something to acquire it. No, no, no. See, salvation, being saved, is simply an expression and an extension of God's grace. Now, Christmas is such a big part of that because before this time, the sins of God's people were only covered temporarily. The concept of salvation didn't truly exist until Jesus came on the scene. There was an act of, of being forgiven that we would, the people of God, that is, could receive from the priest who would offer a sacrifice on their behalf by an animal or, or a, another type of offering, but it was only temporary. That sacrifice had to be offered regularly, annually, occasionally, whatever was required of that particular offering. But you see, when Jesus came, when Christmas entered into the world, there was this announcement that God was saying, I want you to recognize that when my grace comes into your life, when you've been forgiven, you've been forgiven once and for all. 
Oh, look, this is your time to shout right now. I, I don't know how excited you are about that, but I'm grateful to God that I've been forgiven once and for all. I don't have to keep coming back and over and over saying, Lord, when I came to you on February the 7th, 1982, and I asked you to forgive me of all my sins, I don't have to keep coming back bringing that back up. I don't have to say, Lord, forgive me of what I did on that day and that day again because every time I remember it, I just need to remember that I've received his grace through Jesus Christ once and for all being forgiven. Once and for all the blood of Christ has covered that. That's grace that you and I have received that never even existed until Jesus came. I don't need a, I don't want a temporary covering. I don't, I don't want you to forgive me and then next week you not to forgive me. I don't want God to forgive me today and then next week him not forgive me. I need his grace on my life. I need grace from you. You need grace from me. But most of all, we need grace from God. And Christmas is God's way of announcing grace is coming into the world. Grace, as the songwriter said, full and free. Grace that is greater than all my sins. Christmas is an announcement. So I know Missy shared with us when someone says, are you ready for Christmas? Say, yeah, I'm ready for Christmas. Are you ready for Jesus to return? Christmas see, is an announcement that Christ has come. Things are changing. The whole pattern of worship is going to be adjusted. There's going to be a shift in the, in the people of God. Their understanding of God is going to go to a whole new level because suddenly grace is not an occasional or a temporal or, a, or an annual event, but grace is now becoming eternal. And when grace comes into our lives, it's an acknowledgement that God sent Jesus into the world because it's by grace through our faith that, we've been, that we are saved. Romans 5 tells us, and where sin abounds or where sin increases, God's grace increased so much more. I tell you, that's another good place to shout right there. I'd like to think that the moment I said yes to Jesus, I was through forever and ever with all sin, never struggling, never challenged, never stumbling, never falling, but that's just not true. So I want to tell you today, I stand before you as somebody who was forgiven on February the 7th, 1982, and I've been forgiven of sins ever since that day. I wish somebody would join me in thanking God that you've been forgiven and that grace has come into the world through Jesus. Some of y'all looking at me like you ain't never sinned. We know better than that. Here's what our pastor taught us. Roger Brumelow used to say, failure is not final, nor is it fatal in God's grace. Can we just for a moment, can we just for a moment think back, probably not too long ago, and just lift our hands and say, thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you for forgiving me. I know I was stupid. Oh, I know they pushed my buttons. I know they kind of deserved it, but I still shouldn't have done it. I shouldn't have said it. I shouldn't have done that. I should, that was really, really. So thank you for your grace that I received because your grace is an announcement that came through Christmas. Secondly, Christmas is an announcement by God that his presence would be with his people. You see, again, there were those places where in the Old Testament where the children of Israel would go and, and have a visitation with God in a way. There was the, the temple where they would gather together with God. There was the tabernacle in the wilderness that on the, in the outer court there was this big bronze laver where you would be cleansed ceremonially of your sins and then you could perhaps move into uh, the holy place but then there was that inner courtroom, that inner area, the most holy place that only the high priest could enter once a year. And it was in that place where the presence of God would dwell. And the high priest was only able to go in having already offered a sacrifice for his sins, offering sacrifices for the people of God, knowing that there was a, a, a wholeness and a completeness and a forgiveness that had already taken place. And yet there, was a, there were bells around the bottom of his, of his robe it would ring the whole time he's in the Holy of Holies. And uh, the people would know that he was offering sacrifices on their behalf and that he was there and God had received the sacrifices. But there was something else that we understand from history, that there was a rope tied to the ankle of the priest. And the rope was only valuable if the bell stopped ringing. Because if the bell stopped ringing, it was known that the priest had not been truly forgiven and God had required his life in his presence. And the rope was then used to pull him out of the Holy of Holies. Can I just tell you right now, church, 
I'm so grateful that God's grace allows us to be here today in his presence with no bells on the bottom of our garments, no ropes tied around our legs, that he receives us because he wants us to recognize that on your job, in your family, in the grocery store, when you're paying your bill at the restaurant, when you ain't stealing nothing from the mass merchandise, well, I'm just sorry, when you, wherever you go, at your family gatherings, every place you go, Christmas is an announcement that God's presence is always with his people. David put it like this. If I go to the highest mountain, you're there. If I go to the lowest depths of the earth, behold, you are there. God, where can I go to get away from your presence? And the answer is nowhere. He's with you in church. He's with you on your job. He's with you at your family gatherings. He's with you when you're shopping. He's with you when you're sleeping. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. (laughs) Wait, I'm getting the stories mixed up. He knows if you've been bad or good. So be good. For goodness sake. Oh, God's with you everywhere you go. See how easy it is to get the stories merged together? Look what Gabriel said. He appears to Mary and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. Now look, she's already confused. She's already disturbed. She's trying to process this. How much differently would we live if we were always aware that God was with us. Oh, look, when the opportunity came to do something for God and we felt intimidated, if we were just to remember, wait a minute, wait a minute, Christmas was God's announcement that he's with me. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Or if the opportunity came and temptation arose, maybe if we were to remind ourselves, wait a minute, God is with me. He's sitting next to me on the couch, or he's with me in this moment. He's with me. I don't, I don't need to go down that path. I know that God is here. How much differently would we live if we were always cognizant of the fact that God was with us? And that's what Christmas declares. Not only that his grace is available to everybody, but his presence is with us everywhere we go. He says, Mary, I want you to know the Lord is with you. She needed to hear that as the story began to unfold. In Matthew chapter 1, we're told this is the story of Christmas, if you will, from Matthew's eyes, his angle, if you will. He says, the virgin, which, which, behold, the virgin shall be with child, bear a son. They'll call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. God with us. It's a direct quote from Isaiah who prophesied hundreds of years before Jesus that his name would be called Emmanuel. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He would be there. God's saying, listen, no longer do you have to go to a a tabernacle in the wilderness. No longer do you have to go just to the temple in Jerusalem. But now, you and I can hang out everywhere you are, every place you go. God says, I'm going to be there. There was a time that God looked for a temple for his presence for his people to come. But now he's chosen a people in which he places his presence so that everywhere we go, not just at church, not just here, not just in a life group, but everywhere we go, we are carriers, we are bearers of the presence of God. How much differently would we live if we just remembered that God is with me all the time? And that's what Christmas is, a declaration or an announcement that his grace has been extended to everybody, that his presence is with you all the time. I don't know about you, but there have been moments where I would say it this way, and I just really felt the presence of God was with me. But I got to tell you, church, even if you don't feel it, his presence is with you. Oh, I remember, I remember, Missy will remember this story. I'll I'll leave the names out. I'll even leave the church name out so that I don't want to embarrass anybody or I don't want to to, uh, indict anybody. But when we were serving at a church years ago, it wasn't here, it was years and years ago, I was the youth pastor, and uh, we, were, we were going to summer camp. We had a young man who would go to summer camp every year, and uh, we arrived on Monday, you'd leave on Friday. Sometimes, usually by Tuesday, uh, the camp director was kicking him out of camp and calling his parents to come pick him up. It was almost every year. It was a routine. He would, he would break the rules. Wherever the boundaries were on the property, he was the guy that would go beyond the boundaries. Uh, if they weren't supposed to be in this area at this time, he was going to be in that area at that time. And just mischievous young man. Uh, his, man, his, his mom worked at the church. His dad was on the board. Um, Can I just tell you that working at the church and being on the board doesn't guarantee your kids are going to live right? 
Just thought I'd throw that out there in case you were, we were wondering. Well, he, he wasn't a bad kid. He was just mischievous. He always got in trouble. Am I right? Every year we'd be kicked out of summer camp. Every year we'd have to go home early. Well, this particular year, he got in trouble again, but uh, they came to me and said, listen, you know every year we kick him out every year. Man, when we see his name come through on the camp applications, we're like, oh my God, here we go again. You know, and so really, we'd like for you just to talk with it. Well, okay, so now we're at a service uh, on the evening of one of the nights of camp, and he's managed to survive not being sent home yet. And there's this wonderful move of the Spirit of God in the service, and... Um, I wound up asking him. He wasn't responding. I mean, he wasn't engaged in the service. He didn't respond in the altar time. It was just like he would, had a death grip on his chair. And I was just, man, I was drawn to him, and I was praying for him. And so I went over to him, and I said, hey, could, you, could we step over in this side room? I'd just like to talk to you for a moment. He said, yeah. And uh, we got over there, and just I began to share my heart with him about things that I felt like God wanted me to share with him. And I, I want to tell you, this, is, this has been a number of years ago. But there was, there was a time, and I've told Missy this that night, I think, and certainly that week, that I absolutely would not have been surprised if I would have seen Jesus himself physically standing in that room. The presence of the Lord was just so full and so rich. And, so, and I've had moments like that. I've had times in, 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 in experiences of prayer or experiences of worship or in times just going out through life that I, I just wouldn't have been surprised if I would have opened my eyes and seen the Lord standing there physically because the presence of God was just so real. But I have to tell you, even when I don't see him, even when I don't feel him, even when I don't hear him, Christmas is an announcement that God says, I'm with you everywhere you go, every moment of every day. If you feel me, that's good. If you don't, that's all right. If you hear me, that's good. If you don't, that's all right. If you see me, that's great. If you don't, that's all right. Because I want you to know my name is Emmanuel, and it means God with us. Could we just give him a hand of praise right now? Thank him that he's always, always with us. He, he felt so strongly about this, that is God, that he made sure that the writer of Hebrews would include in Hebrews 13, 5, that God has said, I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. Amen. Christmas is an announcement of God's grace, and also of God's presence. But thirdly, Christmas is an announcement that God wants to bless his people. My wife's the only one who gets excited about being blessed by God. So I'm going to say that again. Christmas is an announcement that God wants to bless his people. Look, I don't know about you, but I can't live without the blessings of God. I've got an alarm clock. I set it, I guess, every day unless I'm off and I don't have to get up at a particular time. But it's not my alarm, alarm clock that wakes me up. It's God that wakes us up. It, it's, it's, not, it's not anybody else that puts breath in my lungs. The breath that I have came from God. The next breath I take will come from God. God blesses me with strength, with health, and yes, occasionally with financial blessings above and beyond, but God's been good to me. And Christmas is an announcement that God says, look, I want to bless my people. Let me show you. Luke 1.30. Uh, Gabriel says, don't be frightened, Mary, because he knew she was. He knew she was scared to death. For God has decided to bless you. Now listen, Mary's processing this in the moment. We have the luxury of looking back into the story. We've already seen how it works out. We're like, yeah, that's, that's good. That's great. That ain't no big deal. But it was a big deal to a teenage young virgin girl who had an angelic visitation who says God's going to give you uh, a child miraculously, supernaturally. You've never had... Relationships, I wanted to see, make sure there weren't any kids in the room, have relationships with a guy, and this is going to happen in Mary. This is a blessing. This is a blessing. It's a blessing. Now, I know, I know, I know every time a child, every time somebody discovers they're, going, they're pregnant, you don't consider that to be a blessing. I mean, sometimes it's, it's, it's inopportune, sometimes it's unscheduled, sometimes it's unplanned, sometimes it's an accident. But listen, I want to tell you something. When Mary got this message from Gabriel, he wanted her to know God's blessing you. This is a blessing. Christ coming into your life. Hear me now. I'm, I'm shifting from Mary to us now. Christ coming into your life is the greatest blessing that you and I could ever receive from God. 
In fact, if he never heals me again, he's already done more for me than I deserve. If he never met my needs financially again, he's already done more for me than I ever deserve. He's been better to me than I've ever been to myself. You know why? Because he allowed me by his grace and through his presence to receive Christ into my life. And that is the greatest blessing I could ever receive. Now, I'm grateful for all the other blessings. But God's telling Mary through angel Gabriel, don't be frightened, Mary. I want you to know God's, gonna, God's decided to bless you. How many of you love it? Just go ahead and lift your hand. Beyond. How many of you love it when God blesses you? How many of you could make room for some more blessings? How many of you need to lift your hand and stop telling a story right now because you know you need some more blessings in your life? I love it when God blesses. Watch this blessing, John 3, 16 and 17. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him will not perish. Ooh, what a blessing. But have everlasting life. Oh, my God, what a blessing. Verse 17, for God did not send his son, Jesus, into the world to condemn the world. Now, there's a blessing right there. But rather that through the world, through him might be saved. You see, sometimes mistake, people mistakenly think that God is all about condemning. But he's not. God is all about saving. He's not all. He, God's not this big ogre in the sky with a huge stick ready to hit you in the head when you make a mistake. God's calling you to himself. And Christmas is an announcement of his grace, of his presence, that he wants to bless you. Listen, man, he's blessing you up close. He's blessing you from afar. He's blessing you and I in ways that sometimes we don't even recognize it. Sometimes the blessing of God won't even be revealed maybe until we get to heaven. I mean, just think of how many times that you were almost in an accident. <clears throat> that you almost made a mistake, and you almost lost a job, or you almost dated the wrong person, you ought to shout right there, somebody. But God's blessings sometimes aren't even revealed until later on. But Christmas is an announcement. God's saying, Mary, I'm going to bless you. World, I want to bless you. Look at this last one, Philippians 4. My God will fully supply whatever you need in accordance with his glorious riches in or by Christ Jesus. God's saying, listen, as Christ is coming into the world, I want you to know Grace is coming. My presence is going to be with you always. You don't have to go to Jerusalem only and find me or over to the temple and find me or over to the tabernacle and find me or only at Life Church. But no, my presence is going to be with you everywhere. And I, I, I want you to know I want to bless you. I want to bless you first and foremost with Christ. I want you to have a relationship. I want you to be able to put your head down on your pillow at night and know that things between you and God are okay. I want you to know with confidence that he's going to provide every need that you have according to his his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. God wants you to know he has blessings upon blessings upon blessings for you. Oh, some folks are going to get excited about what's under the tree on Christmas. I'm excited for what God has done for me every day of my life, and I want to thank him right now for all of his blessings, life and strength and health and peace and joy and family and church and his goodness and his kindness. Christmas is an announcement of blessings. And then lastly, because I know we got a luncheon we got to get to, Christmas is an announcement by God that he was establishing his kingdom on earth forever. Watch this. Luke 133. Pastor Christian, if you and the team will come back, please. Gabriel tells Mary, he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Y'all, look. I get it. We're headed into the 2020 presidential elections next year. Some of you are so happy and some of you are so sad. Some of you are so delighted when people are elected and some of you are so angry when they get elected. And I get that to a degree, I really do. But I just want to declare to you today and remind you by the authority of God's word that the kingdoms of this world will rise and fall Political parties will come and they will go. Candidates will come and they will go. Elected officials will come and they will go. Governmental systems will rise and governmental systems will fall. But the kingdom of our God will never fail. It will be the only one that endures forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And it is of this kingdom... It is of this kingdom that Christ came presenting to us. And Gabriel made sure to tell Mary, I want you to know something, Mary. He's going to reign over the house of Israel. That is the people of God. And of his kingdom, there won't be an end. Listen, there are right now countries 
who have made their mind up that they want to do everything they can to destroy Israel. I can't promise you that the land itself will not come under fire. I can't tell you that buildings won't be destroyed. But I can tell you this, that the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our hearts, the God who sent Christ into this world, his kingdom will never end. It doesn't matter how many governments rise. It doesn't matter how many people take arms. The people of God will stand strong. The kingdom of God will never fail. God's kingdom will prevail. And the kingdoms of this world, Revelation says, have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and of his kingdom. There will be no end. I'm glad to be a part of that kingdom. So when people start asking me about how I voted, or was this my candidate, or is this my party, my own family doesn't know how I vote. Missy might, but my kids don't know how I vote. And I don't tell you how I vote, and I don't try to tell you how to vote. Because I believe that the kingdom of God consists of people of all varying views and political expressions, all that kind of stuff, but we should be able to come together as we do, as the people of God, because we recognize we're not here for a political rally. We're here for a gathering of the kingdom of God. That's what unites us. Oh, a lot of things try to pull us apart, but I want to declare today that of this kingdom, there will be no end. God's kingdom will rule and reign forever and ever and ever. And I'm so grateful. So when people want to pick your brain and they want to find out who you vote for and what party you're part of and all that, could you just tell them, yeah, I'm, I'm, of, the, I'm of the kingdom party. The what? I'm of the kingdom party. I voted for Jesus. And you know what? They'll think you're so weird, they'll just leave you alone eventually. And then you can just do your thing and don't worry about it. 1 Corinthians 4.20, the kingdom of God is not just fancy talk. It's living by God's power. When he invites us into this kingdom, he gives us the power that, ex that exists within the kingdom so that we can live like God wants us to live. How many of you want to live like God wants you to live? I know I do. And then lastly, Revelation, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever and ever. Corey Ten Boom once said this, If Jesus were born 1,000 times in Bethlehem and not in me, then I would still be lost. So you see, Christmas is an announcement of God's grace, of his presence, that he wants to bless his people, and that his kingdom would never end. You and I are a part of something that, will, that existed before we got into it and will exist long after we're gone because of this kingdom, there will be no end. Can we stand together? Thanks for joining us today. We hope this message ministered to you. We'd love to connect with you online, our website, www.lifechurchsmyrna.com. Thanks for joining us today. God bless you.